Book Nine, Part One. Last of all comes the tyrannical man, about whom we have once more to ask, how is he formed out of the democratical? And how does he live, in happiness or in misery? Yes, he said, he is the only one remaining. There is, however, I said, a previous question, which remains unanswered. What question? I do not think that we have adequately determined the nature and number of the appetites, and until this is accomplished, the inquiry will always be confused. Well, he said, it is not too late to supply the omission. Very true, I said, and observe the point which I want to understand. Certain of the unnecessary pleasures and appetites I conceive to be unlawful. Every one appears to have them, but in some persons they are controlled by the laws and by reason, and the better desires prevail over them. Either they are wholly banished, or they become few and weak, while in the case of others they are stronger, and there are more of them. Which appetites do you mean? I mean those which are awake when the reasoning and human and ruling power is asleep. Then the wild beast within us, gorged with meat or drink, starts up, and having shaken off sleep, goes forth to satisfy his desires, and there is no conceivable folly or crime, not excepting incest, or any other unnatural union, or parricide, or the eating of forbidden food, which, at such a time, when he has parted company with all shame and sense, a man may not be ready to commit. Most true, he said. But when a man's pulse is healthy and temperate, and when before going to sleep he has awakened his rational powers, and fed them on noble thoughts and inquiries, collecting himself in meditation, after having first indulged his appetites neither too much nor too little, but just enough to lay them to sleep, and prevent them and their enjoyments and pains from interfering with the higher principle, which he leaves in the solitude of pure abstraction, free to contemplate and aspire to the knowledge of the unknown, whether in past, present, or future, when again he has allayed the passionate element, if he has a quarrel against any one, I say, when, after pacifying the two irrational principles, he rouses up the third, which is reason, before he takes his rest, then, as you know, he attains truth most nearly, and is least likely to be the sport of fantastic and lawless visions. I quite agree. In saying this, I have been running into a digression, but the point which I desire to note is that in all of us, even in good men, there is a lawless, wild beast nature, which peers out in sleep. Pray, consider whether I am right, and you agree with me. Yes, I agree. And now remember the character which we attributed to the democratic man. He was supposed from his youth upwards to have been trained under a miserly parent, who encouraged the saving appetites in him, but discountenanced the unnecessary, which aim only at amusement and ornament? True. And then he got into the company of a more refined, licentious sort of people, and taking to all their wanton ways, rushed into the opposite extreme for an abhorrence of his father's meanness. At last, being a better man than his corruptors, he was drawn in both directions, until he halted midway, and led a life not of vulgar and slavish passion, but of what he deemed moderate indulgence in various pleasures. After this manner the democrat was generated out of the oligarch? Yes, he said, that was our view of him, and is so still. And now, I said, years will have passed away, and you must conceive this man, such as he is, to have a son, who is brought up in his father's principles. I can imagine him. Then you must further imagine the same thing to happen to the son, which has already happened to the father. He is drawn into a perfectly lawless life, which by his seducers is termed perfect liberty, and his father and friends take part with his moderate desires, and the opposite party assist the opposite ones. As soon as these dire magicians and tyrant-makers find that they are losing their hold on him, they contrive to implant in him a master passion, to be lord over his idle and spendthrift lusts, a sort of monstrous winged drone. That is the only image which will adequately describe him. Yes, he said, that is the only adequate image of him. And when his other lusts, amid clouds of incense and perfumes and garlands and wines, and all the pleasures of a dissolute life, now let loose, 
come buzzing around him, nourishing to the utmost the sting of desire which they implant in his drone-like nature. Then at last this lord of the soul, having madness for the captain of his guard, breaks out into a frenzy, and if he finds in himself any good opinions or appetites in process of formation, and there is in him any sense of shame remaining, to these better principles he puts an end, and casts them forth until he has purged away temperance, and brought in madness to the full. Yes, he said, that is the way in which the tyrannical man is generated. And is not this the reason why of old love has been called a tyrant? I should not wonder. Further, I said, has not a drunken man also the spirit of a tyrant? He has. And do you know that a man who is deranged and not right in his mind will fancy that he is able to rule not only over men, but also over the gods? That he will. And the tyrannical man, in the true sense of the word, comes into being when, either under the influence of nature, or habit, or both, he becomes drunken, lustful, passionate? Oh, my friend, is not that so? Assuredly. Such is the man, and such is his origin. And next, how does he live? Suppose, as people facetiously say, you were to tell me. I imagine, I said, at the next step in his progress, that there will be feasts, and carousals, and revelings, and courtesans, and all that sort of thing. Love is the lord of the house within him, and orders all the concerns of his soul. That is certain. Yes, and every day and every night desires grow up many and formidable, and their demands are many. They are indeed, he said. His revenues, if he has any, are soon spent. True. Then comes debt and the cutting down of his property. Of course. When he has nothing left, must not his desires, crowding in the nest like young ravens, be crying aloud for food, and he, goaded on by them, and especially by love himself, who is in a manner the captain of them, is in a frenzy, and would fain discover whom he can defraud or despoil of his property, in order that he may gratify them? Yes, that is sure to be the case. He must have money, no matter how, if he is to escape horrid pains and pangs. He must. And, as in himself there was a succession of pleasures, and the new got the better of the old and took away their rights, so he, being younger, will claim to have more than his father and his mother, and if he has spent his own share of the property, he will take a slice of theirs. No doubt he will. And if his parents will not give way, then he will try first of all to cheat and deceive them. Very true. And if he fails, then he will use force and plunder them. Yes, probably. And if the old man and woman fight for their own, what then, my friend? Will the creature feel any compunction at tyrannizing over them? Nay, he said, I should not feel at all comfortable about his parents. But, oh heavens, Adimantus, on account of some new-fangled love of a harlot who is anything but a necessary connection, can you believe that he would strike the mother who is his ancient friend and necessary to his very existence, and would place her under the authority of the other when she is brought under the same roof with her, or that, under like circumstances, he would do the same to his withered old father, first and most indispensable of friends, for the sake of some newly found blooming youth who is the reverse of indispensable? Yes, indeed, he said, I believe that he would. Truly, then, I said, a tyrannical son is a blessing to his father and mother. He is indeed, he replied. He first takes their property, and when that fails, and pleasures are beginning to swarm in the hive of his soul, then he breaks into a house, or steals the garments of some knightly wayfarer. Next he proceeds to clear temple. Meanwhile, the old opinions which he had when a child, and which gave judgment about good and evil, are overthrown by those others which have just been emancipated, and are now the bodyguard of love, and share his empire. These, in his democratic days, when he was still subject to the laws and to his father, were only let loose in the dreams of sleep. But now that he is under the dominion of love, he becomes always, and in waking reality, what he was, then very rarely, and in a dream only, he will commit the foulest murder, or eat forbidden food, or be guilty of any other horrid act. 
love is his tyrant, and lives lordly in him and lawlessly, and being himself a king, leads him on, as a tyrant leads a state, to the performance of any reckless deed by which he can maintain himself and the rabble of his associates, whether those whom evil communicates have brought in from without, or those whom he himself has allowed to break loose within him by reason of a similar evil nature in himself. Have we not here a picture of his way of life? Yes, indeed, he said. And if there are only a few of them in the state, and the rest of the people are well disposed, they go away and become the bodyguard or mercenary soldiers of some other tyrant who may probably want them for a war? And if there is no war, they stay at home and do many little pieces of mischief in the city? What sort of mischief? For example, they are thieves, burglars, cut-purses, footpads, robbers of temples, man-stealers of the community, or if they are able to speak, they turn informers, and bear false witness, and take bribes. A small catalogue of evils, even if the perpetrators of them are few in number. Yes, I said, but small and great are comparative terms, and all these things, in the misery and evil which they inflict upon a state, do not come within a thousand miles of the tyrant, when this noxious class and their followers grow numerous and become conscious of their strength, assisted by the infatuation of the people, they choose from among themselves the one who has most of the tyrant in his own soul, and him they create their tyrant. Yes, he said, and he will be the most fit to be a tyrant. If the people yield, well and good, but if they resist him, as he began by beating his own father and mother, so now, if he has the power, he beats them, and will keep his dear old fatherland or motherland, as the Cretans say, in subjection to his young retainers, whom he has introduced to be their rulers and masters. This is the end of his passions and desires. Exactly. When such men are only private individuals, and before they get power, this is their character. They associate entirely with their own flatterers or ready tools, or, if they want anything from anybody, they in their turn are equally ready to bow down before them, they profess every sort of affection for them, but when they have gained their point, they know them no more. Yes, truly. They are always either the masters or servants, and never the friends of anybody. The tyrant never tastes of true freedom or friendship. Certainly not. And may not we rightly call such men treacherous? No question. Also, they are utterly unjust. If we were right in our notion of justice? Yes, he said and we were perfectly right. Let us then sum up in a word, I said, the character of the worst man. He is the waking reality of what we dreamed. Most true. And this is he who, being by nature most of a tyrant, bears rule, and the longer he lives, the more of a tyrant he becomes. That is certain, said Glaucon, taking his turn to answer. And will not he, who has been shown to be the wickedest, be also the most miserable? and he who has tyrannized longest and most, most continually and truly miserable, although this may not be the opinion of men in general? Yes, he said, inevitably. And must not the tyrannical man be like the tyrannical state, and the democratical man like the democratical state, and the same of the others? Certainly. And as state is to state in virtue and happiness, so is man in relation to man? To be sure. Then comparing our original city, which was under a king, and the city which is under a tyrant, how do they stand as to virtue? They are the opposite extremes, he said, for one is the very best, and the other is the very worst. There can be no mistake, I said, as to which is which, and therefore I will at once inquire whether you would arrive at a similar decision about their relative happiness and misery. And here we must not allow ourselves to be panic-stricken at the apparition of the tyrant, who is only a unit, and may perhaps have a few retainers about him. But let us go as we ought into every corner of the city, and look all about, and then we will give our opinion. A fair invitation, he replied, and I see, as every one must, that a tyranny is the wretchedest form of government, and the rule of a king the happiest. And in estimating the men too, may I not fairly make a like request, that I should have a judge whose mind can enter into and see through human nature? He must not be like a child, who looks at the outside and is dazzled at the pompous aspect which the tyrannical nature assumes to the beholder, but let him be one who has a clear insight. 
may I suppose that the judgment is given in the hearing of us all by one who is able to judge, and has dwelt in the same place with him, and been present at his daily life, and known him in his family relations, where he may be seen stripped of his tragedy attire, and again in the hour of public danger, he shall tell us about the happiness and misery of the tyrant, when compared with other men? That again, he said, is a very fair proposal. Shall I assume that we ourselves are able and experienced judges, and have before now met with such a person? We shall then have some one who will answer our inquiries. By all means. Let me ask you not to forget the parallel of the individual and the state. Bearing this in mind, and glancing in turn from one to the other of them, will you tell me their respective conditions? What do you mean? he asked. Beginning with the state, I replied. Would you say that a city which is governed by a tyrant is free or enslaved? No city, he said, can be more completely enslaved. And yet, as you see, there are free men as well as masters in such a state? Yes, he said, I see that there are, a few, but the people, speaking generally, and the best of them, are miserably degraded and enslaved. Then if the man is like the state, I said, must not the same rule prevail? His soul is full of meanness and vulgarity. The best elements in him are enslaved, and there is a small ruling part, which is also the worst and maddest. Inevitably. And would you say that the soul of such a one is the soul of a free man, or of a slave? He has the soul of a slave, in my opinion. And the state which is enslaved under a tyrant is utterly incapable of acting voluntarily? Utterly incapable. And also the soul which is under a tyrant. I am speaking of the soul taken as a whole, is least capable of doing what she desires. There is a gadfly which goads her, and she is full of trouble and remorse? Certainly. And is the city which is under a tyrant rich or poor? Poor. And the tyrannical soul must be always poor and insatiable? True. And must not such a state and such a man be always full of fear? Yes, indeed. Is there any state in which you will find more of lamentation and sorrow, and groaning and pain? Certainly not. And is there any man in whom you will find more of this sort of misery than in the tyrannical man, who is in a fury of passions and desires? Impossible. Reflecting upon these and similar evils, you held the tyrannical state to be the most miserable of states? And I was right, he said. Certainly, I said. And when you see the same evils in the tyrannical man, what do you say of him? I say that he is by far the most miserable of all men. There, I said, I think that you are beginning to go wrong. What do you mean? I do not think that he has as yet reached the utmost extreme of misery. Then who is more miserable? One of whom I am about to speak. Who is that? He who is of a tyrannical nature, and instead of leading a private life, has been cursed with the further misfortune of being a public tyrant. From what has been said, I gather that you are right. Yes, I replied, but in this high argument you should be a little more certain, and should not conjecture only, for of all questions this respecting good and evil is the greatest. Very true, he said. End of Book Nine Part 1 Recording by Geoffrey Edwards